Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Consumer Protections and Rights uh, with Transportation Companies. So um, we are holding these webinars, the South Carolina Office of Regulatory Staff, um, in honor of National Consumer Protection Week, which is the first week in March each year, um, to help inform consumers on their rights and protections in the various industries that we work on um, and work with here with the Office of Regulatory Staff. Um, so before we get into the webinar, I wanna cover a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the first being that you all have entered the webinar on mute. So I do ask that um, you remain on mute throughout the presentation. Um, so that way we can reduce any kind of background noise. Um, as well as um, everyone's videos are off, um, feel free if you'd like to, to turn your video on if you want, but you do not have to. Um, and also we have a chat box. So if you have questions throughout the chat or throughout the presentation, if you can um, please put those questions in the chat box, we will get to them at the very end of the webinar. Um, or if it is timely to what we're talking about, um, currently or during the presentation, we'll stop and, and go ahead and get that question answered um, before we move on to the next topic. Um, so with that, uh, National Consumer Protection Week is, like I said, uh, celebrated at the beginning of each uh, March. And um, myself, I'm Landon Masters, the Community Outreach and Communications Manager for the Office of Regulatory Staff. Um, and it is my, my job to help to make sure that folks are informed, our consumers are informed and engage with our, our community groups and our uh, folks that we engage with here at the agency. Um, so this is a perfect synergy for us uh, to be able to use this as a platform to bring more information to consumers and the, the folks in the industry that we work with. Um, so Consumer Protection Week is, uh, uh, formulated really to encourage consumers to take full advantage of their rights and to make better informed decisions. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, consumers have the information that they need to uh, then make a decision. So I mentioned we are the Office of Regulatory Staff. So we were created in 2004 and um, our, our main mission is to represent the consumers of investor owned utilities in South Carolina. Um, and that is the public interest of consumers, meaning the continued investment in reliable and high quality services. Um, and with that, we represent those consumers in front of the Public Service Commission of South Carolina. Um, and the PSC is a state agency that sets utilities rates and approves um, a lot of the regula regulatory authority or, or the, um, the stuff that we bring in front of them, just to put it simply, um, or applications for various um, things in, in the transportation world, which we'll get into during today's webinar. Um, so, like I said, we are dealing with a lot of industries. We've hosted two um, other webinars this week, one on electric and natural gas. Um, utilities and then one on water, wastewater, and telecommunications, as well as we did a joint webinar with the South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs on Monday to kick off Consumer Protection Week on just the regulatory process um, in South Carolina. So all of those recordings will be available and you can check out those um, on our website at ors.se.gov um, if you've missed any of those webinars. So today, as I mentioned, we're focusing on transportation and um, we have uh, two great presenters that will be presenting during the webinar. Um, and although I did want to mention that um, although this may not be directly applicable to um, to a lot of the transportation work that we do, it is important that you know, we are all consumers. Um, well, most of us are probably all consumers of some sort of utility that this would be applicable for. Um, there are public hearings that are held for consumers to be involved in the regulatory process. Um, and it, there are a lot of things, there are a couple of things that we want folks to keep in mind when participating in a public hearing, because we know those emotions can um, get high um, and things can, you know, sort of maybe go off the rails or, or anything like that if you're um, if you're really invested in something and want to make your voice known or your voice heard and 
um, put your your points out there. It's important to keep these tips in mind. Um, so the first being to come early. Um, a public hearing will often be, you know, sometime in, in the evening. Most times there have been some virtual um, public hearings that have been scheduled, um, you know, in the afternoon and in the evening. It just depends on what the commission is um, setting up and what the consumers request. Um, so also make sure that you sign up, sign up for that public hearing, whether it be um, you have to call a number or you have to send an email. There's a formal way that you do have to sign up to be able to speak um, at the public hearing. Um, prepare what you want to say in advance. So be able to uh, to articulate what you want to say um, in, a, in a way that's going to be uh, getting your message across, you know, the way to do that is really to kind of write that down. Um, most times you'll have three minutes to make your statement. Um, so kind of practice it so that you uh, get everything in there that you want to say. And add in your own experience. Um, the commission really needs to hear, you know, how this would impact you as a consumer. Um, so putting in your own experience really does make a difference um, when, you're, when you're speaking in front of the commission and speak slowly and clearly. So. You know, like I said, sometimes uh, emotions can get the best of us and uh, we start speaking very fast or, you know, um, not making all the points that we want to make or we run out of time and, and, and all that. So remember that if you can't make it to that in-person or, or virtual public hearing, that you can always send in written comments. Um, a letter of protest can be sent in to the PSC and it'll be added um, into that official docket as part of the, as part of the docket. Um, so that, like I said, is not as applicable to um, a lot of our transportation work that we do here, but um, it is very applicable to a lot of the, the work that we do with the ORS. Um, so I mentioned we have two great speakers for today's webinar, uh, one being uh, Jenna Sorrell and, Thomas, and the other being Thomas McGill um, here in our transportation department. Um, and they're going to talk about the consumer protections within our transportation work here at ORS. So with that, I will turn it over to Jenna, who is going to kick off our presentations. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you again for taking the time to participate in our webinar today. I'm Jenna Sorrell. I work in the safety, transportation, and telecommunications department, and I'm the transportation and operations manager of that group. I will be covering a portion of our transportation presentation today that's going to talk about uh, passenger carrier transportation. Um, so just to kind of reiterate what Landon said at the beginning, ORS is charged with our, the duty to protect the public. That's what we're here to do. Part of that and part of how we do that is we have regulatory oversight and enforcement over Class C motor carriers, which are going to be those motor carriers that transport passengers for hire or for compensation. Um, Class C passenger carriers are gonna fall into a few different categories. We have taxis, uh, charters, which is also uh, more commonly known as limousines, charter buses. We have a non-emergency uh, stretcher van uh, network as well. And then we also regulate transportation network companies. And those are gonna be your Uber and Lyfts that you see um, all, all over the place now. So one of the main things that we regulate is going to be the insurance. Um, we do uh, keep insurance filings on file for every uh, motor carrier that we regulate. We have to make sure to maintain these for compliance. The insurance that we require for passenger carriers is called a Form E, which is a state filing that is required by South Carolina law to be on file with us to show that a carrier has insurance and that it meets all of the requirements. If current insurance is not on file with us, um, a carrier certificate can be suspended from operating and then um, we have to require that proof of insurance again to be able to reinstate that carrier certificate. So if they don't have that insurance on file with us, they are not able to be operating and they are not covered by insurance at that time. Um, also, we have a nice table here that shows you a breakdown of the different types of carriers that we discussed, the taxis and charters. And it also tells you, you know, what range of passenger capacity 
those go with, but the main point I wanted to focus on here was the insurance uh, limits. So that shows you the state requirements that each type of passenger carrier has to carry in order to be a transportation motor carrier within the state. Next slide, Landon. Thank you. Another main thing that we regulate are license decals. Uh, we do semi-annual motor carrier license decals. We do these twice a year. Uh, they must be paid for and registered so that they register each vehicle that one of these motor carriers intends to use to transport their passengers. We do this, as I said, twice a year. So we have two enforcement periods running from January through June and then July through December. Um, I wanted to hit on this because it's an important thing that's easy for consumers to see in the field. Um, if you walk up to a taxi and if they are licensed with ORS and they're a legal company in the state, then they have to have that license decal displayed on their windshield at all times. And the color of the decal changes um, twice a year for each of those enforcement periods. So there's a picture of it um, on the slideshow there just to give you an idea of what that would look like. And you would need to be looking for that on vehicles in the field. So one main thing that ORS can do and what we do um, twice a year is file petitions to revoke certificates for non-compliance. We revoke these certificates for either one or both of the following reasons. We do this for failure to maintain proof of insurance or for failure to pay those license decal fees. Once a certificate is revoked, a company can no longer operate as a transportation motor carrier in the state. So this is a large tool that we use, like I said, twice a year to be able to enforce whether companies are in compliance, not in compliance, and then we can revoke those certificates to show that that is not a legal company. That is not a company that a consumer wants to use and they will know that they're not active because they have failed to comply with the things that we regulate. So those two first things, the insurance and the decals, um, those are more some of our in-office things that we do. We kind of take a, a collaborative approach to enforcement. So we have those in-office insurance and decal items, and then we also have field enforcement. So we have three transportation inspectors throughout the state. We have uh, John Teeter, James McAllister, and George Parker. Mm. Excuse me. And so these transportation inspectors do um, a variety of different things in the field to provide regulatory enforcement. They do investigations of motor carriers, they handle and field complaints and will also investigate complaints as needed. And then they are also looking at all of those vehicles, those taxi charter company vehicles. They're looking for those decals. They're looking for the name of the company to be lettered on them, correct license plates, certificate numbers, all types of things to ensure that they're looking out to make sure these carriers are regulated and in compliance. And they also can perform driver file audits on each of the drivers for a company. One of the most important tools that we have, I believe for consumers is a regulated carriers list. So every two months on the ORS website and there's a link provided there on the transfer on the um, presentation. We update this list every two months for each type of carrier to show what active regulated carriers we currently have. So for consumers, this is a great tool. You can go right to our website and say you can go to the taxi page. And if you go there and click on the regulated carriers list, you'll be able to see every active carrier that we have. If you see a carrier on this list, you'll know that they have insurance and it meets those minimum coverages, which is just you know one great safety item to be able to check. And then also they are in compliance with decals and everything else that we regulate. So you would know that they are a certified motor carrier. So to cover a little bit about the complaint process, um, for passenger carrier complaints, the first step you need to do is contact our ORS Consumer Services Department. Um, I went ahead and listed the two numbers that we have there. And also on our website, there's a lot of great information on the Consumer Services webpage, 
and some other helpful tools as well. So first step would be to contact consumer services and then someone from the transportation department will contact the consumer and they'll discuss the complaint and see if maybe they need to gather any additional information. And then we, all, we also may contact the carrier or the company that the complaint was made against, you know, in case we need to discuss it with them and hear, you know, what their experience was as well. And then once we gather all that information, we'll do a review of all the documentation and different data that we've collected from the consumer and possibly the company. We will then inform the consumer of our findings. Some of the um, complaint actions that we are able to take, I just wanted to highlight a couple of those. Uh, one possible complaint action is that an ORS transportation inspector, which would be one of those field inspectors, would go to the company and inspect the complaint or the issue in person. And at that time, depending on what the issue was or the complaint, they could issue a warning or possibly even issue a citation, which would be a monetary citation fine for that non-compliance that came from the complaint. Another uh, possible complaint action would be that ORS can petition to revoke that company's certificate, depending on the severity um, or how you know, severe that complaint is or what the issue was. I will say we don't, that's not nearly as common, but we definitely do have the authority and the power to do that. So some key things that consumers can look for. Um, I wanted to drop this into two different sections because we do have on the left side there, you have the taxi, charter, charter bus, non-emergency and stretcher van. Some main things that consumers can look for in the field, say they've called a taxi company to come pick them up and the taxi shows up and some of the main things they can look for to know that that is a certified motor carrier are the company name must be lettered on the vehicle. Um, a lot of vehicles will have contact information listed on there and that's great for them to, to maybe write down or take note of. All regulated carriers have to have a certificate number on their vehicles as well. And this will always be a four digit number. One of those other things I mentioned earlier would be that decal sticker on the windshield. You definitely wanna to try to look for that. There are a few exceptions to that, which are gonna be charter bus and over 20 vehicle carriers. They do not have to have decal stickers. So if for example, you see a vehicle and it, and it doesn't have one, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a regulated carrier, but you're also more than welcome to either contact us and check, or you can use that regulated carriers list that we talked about. Another thing to take note of would be the license plate. And then honestly, when you go up to a vehicle, just look at the overall condition and safety of that vehicle. Over here on the right-hand side, we also have the transportation network companies. I wanted to cover this a little bit separately because they, they do have a few different things that you can use and wanna look for just because they're such a different um, animal, I guess you would say in transportation because as y'all know, um, this would be the Uber and Lyfts of the group. So all of this is done through an app. So you definitely wanna make sure that you book all your trips through the app. You wanna make sure that when you if your Uber shows up, they have the trade dress. So you're gonna wanna look for the decals and such, uh, license plate number on the windshield, and also the make and model of the vehicle. Everything they have on there should match up with the app that you have. And also the driver has requirements as, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> as well. They have to have an ID badge, photograph, and first name. Another thing that I wanted to cover is the FOIA request. This is just a small blurb I wanted to add on here. You can request records and documents from ORS at any time by submitting a FOIA request. You can do this in writing or in person. You can do it under the Freedom of Information Act. And I also put a link, a link to our request guide. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon me, I have a tickle in my throat. <laughs> And so there's a link to it at the bottom as well that goes over all the steps that we have to tell you how to submit a FOIA. 
So if there, I think that's all I have for us, but if there's any questions for me, please put them in the chat box or I'm more than happy to answer them now. And I want to thank everyone again for taking the time today. Awesome. Thank you, Jenna. Um, so like Jenna said, if you have any questions, um, please do feel free to put those in the chat box. I don't um, see any questions in there just yet, but um, if you do have questions, remember to put those in there and we will we'll get those, to those in the end. Um, so next up is Thomas McGill um, and take it away. Thank you, Landon. Uh, I, my name is Thomas McGill, and I'm also employed by the South Carolina Office of Regulatory Staff in the Safety, Transportation, and Telecommunications Department. Uh, I work primarily, as far as the transportation is concerned, with household good movers. And so I work with, the, with these companies as they apply uh, to seek to become legal movers in the state of South Carolina. So I'll go over a little bit of the information that we have uh, in the jurisdiction that we have over these carriers. Uh, and, and be able to answer any questions that you might have towards the end. So as you can see on the, the screen right now, uh, I just ran these numbers the other day. There are currently 145 household good movers in the state of South Carolina. And that ranges from some of your um, smaller locally owned companies to some large, uh, more familiar companies nationwide um, that have all gone through the exact same uh, certification process with the state. And you'll notice that uh, in the last three years there um, that we've had 23 new applicants and there are several pending as you can see. So that's one interesting thing that we have continued to monitor over the last several years, especially is the number of carriers that continue to apply. Uh, I think that a lot of people maybe think that you have your, your standard household good companies that are, that are established and, and have a larger footprint and we don't really see those new companies, but Household good movers are, um, it's an ever-changing industry. We see companies that, uh, that close up businesses for various reasons, uh, but also see a lot of companies that seek to, uh, to apply and gain the, the certification or to operate legally in the state. And on the next slide, we'll see here, um, similar to what Jenna discussed earlier, we have on our website, um, and, and I provided the link there, uh, as to where you could easily find the list of carriers that are licensed in the state. If you click on that link, and then uh, it's the, the first, um, the first sub link underneath there under household goods is where you'll see the regulated carriers in South Carolina. That list is updated uh, on our website periodically as companies come into compliance and then are, uh, are no longer certified. So hopefully that is a great resource for you as the consumer to use as you do um, you're looking into who you might want to use when you and your family are, are moving your goods. Uh, so again, uh, the certificate number is a big identifier for uh, you as the consumer to seek and to, to look for when, um, when looking for moving companies. That certificate number should be on every moving truck that a, that a company owns, as well as any print advertising. That's the way that the regulations read is that the each company has to provide that certificate number in all print advertising. So business cards, um, advertisements in maybe the newspaper or things like that. Now, I know that uh, in today's world, a lot of advertising is done online as well. And at, if you ever have any questions or see any advertising done by a moving company that online that does not have a certificate number or that you can't find it, please feel free to either access that link that's provided uh, on this website or on this um, slideshow, or just give our office a call. Um, our contact information will be at the end of this presentation. And if you ever have any questions about that, please give me a call and I will gladly be able to help you through um, letting you know whether companies are licensed or not. And then also um, what type of tariff they have set up. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. Um, and so, kind of getting into what we do and do not regulate and have jurisdiction over as the Office of Regulatory Staff. Uh, we'll talk about inner city moves. FWA is an acronym for fit, willing, and able, and that's a kind of certificate that moving companies have the opportunity to pursue if they so choose. The scope is when we refer to the uh, amount of space. E each carrier is licensed 
for a particular area in the state. Now, a large percentage of our carriers do have, uh, they have an approved scope of the entire state of South Carolina. However, there are some that are only able to move you in certain counties within the state. And that's something that is in their tariff and that also we have uh, all that information as well. And we just wanna make sure that your goods that are, that are usually some of the most precious and valuable things that you and your family own, whether that be from mon a monetary value or just an intrinsic value that, that you want to make sure are protected and is done in the right way. And then commercial and labor type moves. And so when, when we talk about these, uh, a commercial move is similar to how it sounds if a, a moving company were to do a move for a business. Uh, let's say that they had a contract set up, an independent contract set up for uh, an assisted living facility or uh, maybe a, de a delivery service for a furniture store or something like that then that, those are things that uh, are not often included in their tariff and are not regulated by us at the Office of Regulatory Staff. And the same goes for if you were to hire a moving company to just do the labor portion of your move. And an example of that would be if you wanted to rent a U-Haul or a Penske and have that at your place of residence and then hire the moving company to come in, do all the packing and do all the loading of those goods into that truck. And then you as the customer drive that truck to its final destination, then the a, a company does not have to have a certificate issued by our agency in order to do that type of move as well. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go through these next couple of slides. So the inner city moves, and this is where um, it, it's very important to kind of understand exactly what that means because even from a jurisdictional standpoint and the way that we look at it at the Office of Regulatory Staff, the terminology is a little bit different than what the, the moving industry typically uses. When we talk about inner city moves and oftentimes we'll use the term local moves, that's referring to a move that starts and finishes within the same city limit. So an example of that would be if you live down in uh, the city of Charleston and, and you're moving just a couple of neighborhoods over or something like that, and your destination is still inside the city limit of Charleston, then the company is technically not bound by their tariff in those situations. And I'll touch on tariffs now while we're talking about that a little bit. So the, the company, each moving company has a approved tariff that lays out all the rates and charges that they are able to charge you as the customer. And most companies have those set up on an hourly structure. For example, they might say two men in a truck is gonna be charged at $110 an hour and three men in a truck might be set up at $135 an hour and so forth. And the, but all of those charges have to be in their tariff, which is a public document that you as the customer have the right to ask for and the moving company has the obligation to provide you with that. Um, in those tariffs, there are also things that the company might charge for uh, that are as additional services. For example, uh, bulky articles is a very common thing that we see moving companies um, charge for. And an example of that would be if you have a piano or a large freezer or a pool table, some of those things are very common items that we see moving companies have specifically um, set aside in their tariff for an additional fee. And the, usually the reason for that would be because of the extra manpower that it takes, the extra protection that it takes, and that kind of thing. And so that's where some of those additional fees will come in. However, all of those fees should be inside of their tariff. And I think that's very important as the consumer to understand that you, can, you have the complete right to ask for that tariff and do your research to see what they are able to charge you and how they come up with some of the estimates and then the actual charges that are applied to your move. Um, and so getting back to the, the inner city moves, if, if we were to file a complaint with us at the Office of Regulatory Staff and it looked like it was very close um, as far as being inside the same city limit, what we do is we have a layer on the Google Earth program that lays out all of the city limits inside of the state of South Carolina. And all we do is simply just plug in the origination or the starting point and the destination, the final uh, delivery address. And we just click on um, the directions. And if it crosses over that city limit, 
then yes, that move is 100% regulated rates and everything by the Office of Regulatory Staff. However, if that move stays within the city limits, then the rates are not uh, required to be exactly how they're listed in the tariff. Now, I'll tell you that in my um, communication with a large percentage of companies, I would say that 98 to 99% of companies use the exact same rates for inner city moves, as well as uh, moves that maybe go across the state. And the main reason for that is just to avoid any confusion and uh, and their goal is not to, to blindside you or to, to pull the wool over your eyes so that you feel like you've been um, taken advantage of at the end. Um, on the next slide here, we talk about fit, willing, and able. Um, and if, if a company is doing moves that are staying within city limits, so we, we do not um, regulate the rates on those moves, however, companies are still required to have a certificate issued by the Office of Regulatory Staff and the Public Service Commission to do those jobs. And if, if a company were to strictly operate in my example earlier in the city of Charleston and they never crossed out of the city of Charleston, then they would need a certificate of fit, willing and able. And, um, and this is the, the regulation, the section in the regulation that details that out and explains why that is. I won't read that to you. Um, but again, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out to our office. Um, and, but I would say that a large percentage of moves, in my experience, have crossed over city limits and therefore they would need the full public certificate of public convenience and necessity, which encapsulates the fit, willing, and able certificate as well. <clears throat> uh, on the scope, I touched on this a little bit, but I think it's also very important just to circle back around to when we talk about the, uh, the scope in which your move um, spans across. So like I, as I mentioned earlier, every moving company has applied for a specific scope and they can apply for statewide authority in which they could move you from down in Charleston to up to Greenville or uh, from down in Beaufort to up to Horry County, things like that. But they also have the opportunity to, and some of, we see this a lot of times uh, or most of the time when this happens, it's with our much smaller companies that they want to stay very local. And so they will apply for a three county authority or up to a three county authority. And the, the main thing to remember about this is that these counties must be contiguous or they all must touch. So if you're looking in the Midlands, it, it might be that you apply for Richland County, Lexington County and Aiken County, which all touch um, spanning uh, into the Midlands, obviously, of South Carolina. And the, the thing to realize as a customer is that a company who um, wants to do your move, who might have a limited scope, meaning not the entire state, if you're moving from say Aiken to Charleston, then a company who has the Aiken, Lexington, Richland scope could not do that move. It's important that you understand that companies, uh, their scope is for the origination and the destination. So we've had some confusion in the past in which, and it comes from the, custom, from the company side as well, where they have believed that as long as uh, one of the locations, the origination or the destination is within their approved scope that they have the ability to do that move. But it's important to know that the starting place and the final destination must be uh, in that scope in which they've been approved for. So that's important for you to understand um, as far as what a company is able to do and not do for you. <clears throat> and then I touched on the commercial and labor as well, that uh, carriers can conduct commercial moves without a certificate and, and that includes office moves. So let's say that you come in, a, a company would want to come into your place of business and, and just move furniture around, that kind of thing. That would fall more into that labor only type of a, a category and therefore would, they would not need to be a licensed mover in order to do that. And we talked about the labor only as well. Um, so I won't got, go into that in much detail again. <clears throat> so when it comes to complaints with the household goods side of things, I know that Jenna touched on the, the passenger carrier. Um, and these are some of the three most common types of complaints that we get from you, the customer, when it comes to moving companies and moving your goods. And it goes, it, it details overcharges, 
damages and what type of insurance coverage that is, as well as the customer relations side of that. And um, I think it's important to know what we have the ability and maybe lack some jurisdiction and how we're able to help you in certain areas. And I, and I think it's important that you as the customer understand that. So when it comes to overcharges, if you, if you have um, hired a mover to move your goods from one place to another, and they've told you that it's, it can be moved for $1,500, and then you get your final bill and it's $3,000. I, as a customer, you would be shocked by that. And again, that's something that we get a lot of calls about. And so in that instance, you would call our consumer services department, similar to the passenger carrier, and you would file a formal complaint against that mover. Now, our consumer services department will um, log that information into their database and then get that information over to me or someone else in our department. And we would reach out to you and ask for a lot of the information in terms of the move itself. So we would ask for your bill of lading, which um, again is a document that each company has approved by the commission and by ORS, and that should accompany every single move that they do. It's basically an invoice or uh, a receipt, if you will, of what types of services that have been performed in moving your goods. And on that bill of lading, it lays out the hourly the hourly rate based on the number of men and the number of trucks. It also will include um, any bulky articles or things like that that were associated with your move. And what we do in that situation is we conduct an audit um, and we, we take the bill of lading that you provided us and we also get that same bill of lading from the company. And the reason we do that is just to make sure that we're, it's the exact same information from both parties. And we simply just add up the charges that are on the bill of lading and make sure that it matches with the charges that are in their approved tariff. One thing that we most commonly get with, um, with customers filing complaints is that they, the estimate was one thing and the final charge was completely different. And oftentimes that is higher. And it's important as a consumer that you understand that estimates are not regulated in the state of South Carolina. So for example, if you get an estimate of the $1,500 and the move comes in at 3,000, then we're gonna make sure that that $3,000 was charged correctly based on their tariff. And if that is accurate, then unfortunately, as from, from our regulatory agency, we're unable to, uh, to help you as much because they, the company charged things as their approved tariff states. Now that is bad business practice and, and we keep record of those things as well. Um, and would talk with the company about doing a better job about issuing their estimates and things like that. But unfortunately, estimates are not regulated in South Carolina. Now, let's say on the flip side that you were charged at $3,000 and we do the math on your bill of lading and the, on the one the company provides us. And we do see that the actual charges should have been $1,500 as the estimate stated. Then yes, we contact the company and we, uh, we explained to them that it looks as though they overcharged you as the customer and they would issue a refund to you so that they are not overcharging you as the customer. As far as damages and insurance is concerned, um, the main thing that we have jurisdiction over is making sure that you as the customer have signed off on some type of insurance or valuation as we call it. And the minimum that is in South Carolina is 60 cent per pound per article. And I think that's important for you to understand as well, because think about a, a large TV um, that you might have that might be worth a, a good amount of money. However, it doesn't weigh that much. With that basic valuation coverage, you would only be, it, it, let's say that the moving company dropped it. Um, and accidents do happen on all moves uh, and your TV was damaged. Then based on that valuation that you signed off or the insurance that you signed off on, the company would only be obligated to reimburse you for 60 cent per pound. Now, a lot of, in, a lot of moving companies offer higher um, valuation or insurance policies, whether that's directly through the company or through third party insurance companies. And I, I say that just so that you as the customer are, know that you have the ability and, and often the responsibility to do that uh, research yourself to make sure that you are protecting your goods as, as well as you can. Um, and again, if 
if we don't have any jurisdiction at the Office of Regulatory Staff over damages themselves. Um, the only thing that we can look at is that you have signed off on some sort of valuation that's at least the 60 cent per pound. And again, the consumer relations, um, let's say that uh, you felt as though the, the movers were very disrespectful or, um, or weren't timely, things like that. Unfortunately, the business practices that, that moving companies have, it's difficult to regulate those um, on a black and white, from a black and white perspective. And it's just, it, it's, there's no regulation that gives us much jurisdiction and enforcement in that. Now, we certainly do call companies in situations that you might present us with that you felt like you were treated poorly and maybe get their side of the story and, and try to even things out a little bit. But unfortunately, there's not much that we can do as far as consumer relations are concerned. <clears throat> and I think that we go into a little bit of detail um, with the complaint process that I've kind of gone over a little bit here. So you'll file a, uh, a formal complaint with our consumer services department and, and then we reach out to you with that paperwork. Um, and at the end of our investigation, whether we find it that the, the uh, company did charge you incorrectly or charged you correctly, you are issued a findings letter that we, we send to both you, the customer, as well as to the company. And with some recommendations and the results and the findings that we have found. And it also gives you the customer, if you're not satisfied, uh, of maybe an additional step that you wanna take. Um, but, but as far as ORS is involvement, that would be um, as much as we could do. But again, we do um, very detailed investigations into every complaint that, that we have jurisdiction over and wanna make sure that you, the customer, are protected and have been charged correctly uh, based on the moving company's tariff. <clears throat> um, I'll touch on a little bit about the, the consumer services department as a whole. Um, from the transportation perspective, uh, it, it looks a little bit different from some of the other utilities. I know that, um, and Landon touched on this at the very beginning, that we regulate here at ORS the electric utilities, the water, the wastewater, the gas, um, the gas companies, that kind of thing, natural gas. And so um, they, are, they are much more involved as far as uh, when, when things are cut off by your electric provider or things like that for lack of payment and can, and can help you a lot with things like that. On the transportation side of things, a lot of what they do is they keep record of all complaints that are filed um, by you, the customer, and they keep a database that that way we can track to see if we're seeing an influx of complaints on one specific company. Um, and then what the results of each and every investigation that has been done turned out to be. And then they, um, they will ultimately though give the information that you provided to them over to us in the transportation department. And then that's where that process picks up from our perspective in the transportation department where we will contact you to get details of the move um, and then get that paperwork from you as well. And then I think the, the, the last slide I believe is just some additional resources that we want to make sure that you're aware of. Um, and uh, Landon talked about and being involved in night hearings and things like that. There are not many night hearings on the transportation side of, of, how, of um, our agency, but you can monitor the docket management system, which is that second bullet point on the additional resources page. And in there, you can search for any moving company that you see, have seen on the road or advertising and you can see anything that they have done recently as a company. That includes tariff changes if they have applied to, to change their rates. It also includes what their certificate number is, when it was issued, things like that. And it's there that you would file that letter of protest if you had any opposition over a certain moving company, whether that be applying in general, or if that was, um, if, if if you as the consumer didn't feel that it was right for them to raise their rate, you have every right to make your voice heard. And as Landon mentioned earlier, if you feel that way, I think it is important for you as the customer to make your voice heard. Um, another thing that you can do on the Public Service Commission website is watch the live stream. They have hearings, typically they're every Wednesday, but you can look on their website to see the schedule in which each one is held. And you can, um, you can, feel like you're in the room with those commissioners as they discuss some of the decisions that are made as far as 
um, the status of certain Ruby companies, as well as what their rates are. And again, you can see several other um, things on that list of, of helpful tools for you as the customer, because at the end of the day, um, we want to make sure that, that your rights are protected. And part of the way that we like to do that is to make sure you are aware and know what your rights are. So if you have any other questions, um, I know that we'll probably open up the chat box or maybe even the phone lines to answer any specific questions that you have at this time. And then I think on this last slide, we have our contact information um, of Jenna and myself. If you ever wanna reach out to us and, and ask specific, specific questions, please do not hesitate to do that. Um, and Landon, I think I will turn it back over to you um, to see if we might have any other questions. Yes, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, so we are going to um, go to the chat box. We do have um, one question that has come in, um, but I'd encourage folks if you could um, put your questions in the chat box, if you had those or unmute your, your lines, feel free to do that um, if you would like to ask a question. Um, but the question that we have in the chat, I think um, would go to Jenna. And that is how would the complaint process against a company like Uber or Lyft work um, and any different procedures around that? Okay, so for Uber and Lyft, um, most of their complaint resolution is actually done uh, through the app itself. So if a consumer has an issue or needs to report a problem um, after they have had a trip or, or something else within that same app and within that trip with that driver, there is an option to report an issue and do things like that. So for a consumer, that, that's the route that they're gonna want to take. But of course, we also have contacts with Uber and Lyft as well. So if you ever want to reach out to us and let us know, hey, there, here's this vehicle. If you can get a plate number, that would be great. And give us a description of the vehicle and any, any other details you can provide, then we will take that and pass it along to our contacts with the Uber and Lyft transportation network companies as well. But definitely also go through the app and go through that company and do their process as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and so I know we've uh, talked about about consumer services and um, and Thomas, you know, touched on a lot of the complaints that, you know, they'll they'll um, filter those complaints, you know, and try to address them um, on a case by case basis. But I would encourage you that if you do um, have any kind of issues or anything like that to, to contact them. Um, and if they're not the ones that would answer those questions, they will get your information to uh, whoever would need to, to help you figure out what um, your, the answer to your question. Um, and of course, Thomas and Jenna are always um, more than willing to, to answer. I won't speak for them, but they're, they're wonderful wealth of knowledge in this field. And we've been really um, uh, lucky to have them today to speak about the consumer protections and rights for consumers here in South Carolina. Um, and I'm not seeing any other questions come in in the chat box. So um, we'll give everyone a couple more minutes back to their day. Um, we'll make this recording available on our website. Um, and we'll also send out the slides, a copy of the slides from today's presentation, as well as the link to that recording to everyone that had registered for the webinar. Um, and with that, I will say, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, a wonderful rest of National Consumer Protection Week. Visit ors.sc.gov to find out more about what the Office of Regulatory Staff does. And um, ors.sc.gov slash consumers is where you can find all your information for National Consumer Protection Week. So thank you very, very much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.